Welcome to the Aboriginal channel. On this episode will be part two to uncovering things of Aboriginals that were burnt down and built back on by invading Caucasians. So right here, we're looking at some great fires in the state of Washington. Now, I skipped over a lot of things. I skipped over the 1919 so-called Red Summer, but it went on from April to November, actually. I skipped over that because that's a whole episode in and of itself based upon the connections with Mark. Marcus Garvey and the American Colonization Society. So that's a whole episode by itself. That's why I didn't add it in here. A lot of things were burnt. A lot of Aboriginal owned businesses were burnt in 1919, but I went past that because, like I said, that'll be by itself. We going back when segregation wasn't legal yet, and Aboriginal people still had businesses within the prime locations within the downtown areas of a lot of cities and towns. So right here in the state of Washington, basically, you had a great Walla Walla fire in 1887. It says, in 1887, a fire reduced half of Walla Walla to ash. Most of that era's residential and commercial structures were wood framed, which even with the stone or brick cattling made them vulnerable to fires. So basically, the business section of downtown Walla Walla was burnt in 1887. And then in 1889, there was three fires within about a four to five months range. We had a, the Great Spokane Fire, the Great Ellensburg Fire, and the Great Seattle Fire. It says the Great Spokane Fire, known locally as the Great Fire, was a major fire which affected downtown Spokane, Washington. It began just after 6 p.m. and destroyed the city's downtown commercial district. The Great Ellensburg Fire, also known as the Independence Day Fire, was a fire that destroyed homes and the business district of Ellensburg in 1889. The Great Seattle Fire was a fire that destroyed the entire central business district of Seattle, Washington on June 6, 1889. Because of the fire, the buildings in downtown Seattle now sit some 20 feet above the original street level. Now, Seattle has what is called the underground tourist attraction says go underground on a one hour walking history tour through Seattle's original neighborhood. So the original neighborhood, at least a section of it was underground. They trying to say that the entire city of Seattle was built on top of the old city, which was on ground level, which that's just a major thing to me. But basically, Seattle has that underground city that used to belong to Aboriginal people, but they took it over and now it's a tourist attraction. So here we'll move to the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It says the Great Chicago Fire was a conflagration that burned in the American city of Chicago during 1871. The fire killed approximately 300 people, destroyed roughly 3.3 square miles of the city, including over 17,000 structures, and left more than 100,000 residents homeless. The fire began in a neighborhood south west of the city center. A long period of hot, dry wind conditions and the wooden construction prevalent in the city led to the conflagration. The fire leaped the south branch of the Chicago River and destroyed much of the central Chicago and then leaped the main branch of the river, consuming the near north side. Now, down here on the map, we can look at and see what the near north side was. Right here was the near north side, basically this whole area along the river that burned. It says it started down here in this southwest area of the city center and then jumped and burned the near north side. Okay, so right here is the area of the Great Fire of 1871 in Chicago. So the center of downtown Chicago is basically right here where this yellow is at. Now they're saying that the fire started in the southwest in a neighborhood in the southwest and traveled to the near north side and that basically looks like this it was down he started down here and then it got up here now what i'm saying is that this whole area where this fire was at was owned and operated in 1871 by aboriginal people so how do we look at that okay we got to look at the historic Aboriginal neighborhoods in Chicago, or at least some of the streets. So right here it says Clark Street, Lincoln Avenue, Archer Avenue, Elson Avenue, and Milwaukee Avenue are some of the most prominent. 
Okay, so those streets are exactly right here. Now it says the Southwest, which is right here, South and West, right here, it started right here, which would have been Archer Avenue. See right here, this little wooded area with the water, the little creek running through it and everything, that's Archer Avenue where the Aboriginal people were. And that's down here, right here. Archer Avenue right here. Clark Street, we'll look at Clark Street and where it's at. Clark Street is right here, North Clark Street, and Clark Street is up here in this area, which is the area that was burned in the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, Clark Street. And to get a better idea of the destruction right here under Clark Street's Wikipedia page, you can see a little image of burnt down buildings, half standing buildings right there. It says the stereoscopic image of Clark Street after the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. Lincoln Avenue, which it says Lincoln Avenue was one of the aboriginal neighborhoods historically, which is right here in the burn area. So here we have a little image of the near north side so we understand what we're working with here. There's the middle of Chicago, and then here's the near north side. So far, we looked at Clark Street, Lincoln Avenue, and Archer Avenue. Milwaukee Avenue is also in the burn area. Milwaukee Avenue is right here in this section right here in the burn area. Right here is where that Archer neighborhood was at, right here. So the fire started here and worked its way all through here right here, which I'm saying was the original people where the original aboriginal strongholds were at and businesses. Then right here is we looking at Elston Avenue, which is also a historic Aboriginal neighborhood right here in the near north side, right here. Once this fire was over with and the whole place was, the whole Aboriginal communities right there was destroyed, the people moved down here to a neighborhood called Bronzeville. And in 1874, there was what was called the second fire of Chicago. The Chicago Fire of 1874 took place on the evening of July 14th in an area neighboring that of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. The neighborhood was mostly comprised of Jewish immigrants of various nationalities and middle class African Americans. So they burnt this whole area to get the people out, moved down here to Bronzeville, and then burnt them again, burnt them out again. Now, if you look at the tunnel locations in downtown Chicago are basically all over the area of Chicago. You'll see that most of the tunnels are in this area right here, the burn area. So basically, I showed you where Chicago's historic Aboriginal neighborhoods, Clark Street, Lincoln Avenue, Archer Avenue, Elson Avenue, and Milwaukee Avenues, which were the most prominent, how they were burnt in the great Chicago fire of 1871 right here on the map. Now, this is a clear case. To me, this is very easy to see what exactly happened there. And I'm saying that this thing took place all over the country. They will burn you out. Now, some may wonder why they would come along three years later and burn the Aboriginal community down again. And for that, I have two reasons that I came up with using common sense. So in previous videos back in the days, I talked about how during the Civil War, they went around destroying all the records, destroying Aboriginal towns and communities which held records. So beyond the obvious reason of burning it down, because if they burnt the first place down and then built on it and became the controllers of it and they discovered the tunnels and discovered that the tunnels led to the communities that they burnt down in the southern part, which is the Bronzeville area in 1874. But right here, I'm going to go in and just look at the Kentucky research outline county information just to give a reminder of what was going on during the Civil War and afterwards. So in the county information it says that Bath County had disasters in 1864 that destroyed many records. Urban County, a disaster in 1872 caused the loss of some records. Oil County, a disaster in 1860 destroyed some records. Breathitt County, disasters in 1866 and in 1873 destroyed most records. Breckenridge County, disasters in 1869 caused the loss of some records. Caldwell County, a disaster in 1864 destroyed some records. Christian County, a disaster in 1864 destroyed most records. Clinton County, 
disasters in 1865 and 1890 destroyed some records. Crittenden County, disasters in 1865 and 1870 destroyed most records. Cumberland County, disasters in 1865 destroyed most records. Davies County, a disaster in 1865 destroyed some records. Graves County, had disasters in 1864 and 1896, which destroyed some records. Braston County, disasters in 1864 and 1866, destroyed some records. Hardin County, a disaster in 1864, destroyed some records. Harlan County, a disaster in 1863, destroyed some records. LaRue County, a disaster in 1865, destroyed most of the records. It says that McGoffin was created in 1860, and a disaster has caused the loss of some records. Marion County, a disaster in 1863 destroyed most of the records. Metcalf County, a disaster in 1867 destroyed most records. Monroe County, disasters in 1863 and 1887 destroyed most records. Montgomery County, a disaster in 1863 destroyed most records. Morgan County, disasters in 1862 destroyed most records. Mullenberg County, disasters in 1862 destroyed most records. Ohio County, a disaster in 1864 destroyed most records. Howe County, a disaster in 1864 destroyed most records. Pulaski County, a disaster in 1871 destroyed most records. Robertson County, a disaster in 1871 destroyed most of the records. Rock Castle County, a disaster in 1874 destroyed many of the records. Rowan County, a disaster in 1864 destroyed most of the records. Now this one says, in Simpson County, a fire in May of 1882 destroyed most of county court records. Deeds, however, were later reconstructed from originals held by the owners. So understand they was burning them deeds, right? They was taking that land away. Spencer County, a disaster in 1865, destroyed most of the records. Taylor County, a disaster in 1864, destroyed most of the records. Warren County, a disaster in 1864, destroyed most of the records. Now, that was Kentucky. So during the Civil War, they was going around destroying things and basically destroying the records, covering up the institution of white slavery, burning up the records of the land deeds so people, if they didn't have that document, they couldn't claim that land. And then burning the whole communities at like 12 at night, 4 in the morning, 2 in the morning was a way that people would wake up in a hurry to save themselves and forget to save the documents, things like that. They was playing tricks. So I'm going to go over here to a historical document from Kentucky. It says, Memorial of a Committee Appointed at a Meeting of Colored Citizens of Frankfort, Kentucky and Vicinity. It says, To the Senate and House of Representatives and Congress Assembled. We, the colored citizens of Frankfurt and vicinity, do this day memorialize your honorable bodies upon the condition of affairs now existing in the state of Kentucky. Now, if you go look at the treaties, the Indian treaties, this right here sounds exactly like an a Indian treaty. Now, I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read where you get the understanding of what's going on. It says, we would respectfully state that life, liberty, and property are unprotected among the colored race of this state. Organized bands of desperate and lawless men, mainly composed of soldiers of the late rebel armies, armed, disciplined, and disguised, and bound by oath and secret obligations, have by force, terror, and violence subverted all civil society among colored people. Thus, utterly rendering insecure the safety of persons and property, overthrowing all those rights which are the primary basis and objects of the government, which are expressly guaranteed to us by the Constitution of the United States as amended. We believe you are not familiar. Now, this is 1871. April of 1871, this is. Okay, it says, we believe you are not familiar with the description of the Ku Klux Klan's riding nightly over the country, going from county to county in all the county towns, spreading terror wherever they go by robbing, whipping, ravishing, and killing our people without provocation, compelling colored people to, to break the ice and bathe in the chilly waters of the Kentucky River. Now, 
They went around destroying their, basically their towns and cities and their records during the Civil War. And then afterwards, they terrorized them to get them to move off the land. But another thing, and the reason why they would have burnt Chicago, the Aboriginal community in Chicago a second time, was to get rid of the things that can connect Aboriginal people to the Indians, which is artifacts and things like that. So down here, he gives a list. These Aboriginal peoples in Kentucky gives a list, a long list of the things that are going on. And it says that the representative there only said that a few things occurred. And since they knew that that was a lie, they made a list themselves to give to the government. I'm not going to go through every one, but I'm going to say number 33 right here. I'll read a couple before I get to 33. 31 says William Parker whipped by Klux Klux in Lincoln County. Number 32, mob attacked and fired into house of Jesse Davis's in Lincoln County. 33, spears taken from his room at Harrisburg by disguised men. So they took some spears from an aboriginal's room in Harrisburg, right, in 1869. So again, they were, the Ku Klux Klan was not only just to disenfranchise aboriginal people economically and politically, but they also were stripping the identity, the physical artifacts and things that aboriginals had left over from their heritage. They were stripping them of that. Right here it says, the spears taken from his room at Harrisburg by disguise men. Now, does Frankfort, Kentucky have underground tunnels? Well, about 80 miles north at North Kentucky University, there's tunnels. Right here it says, Tunnel to the Truth, the legend, the vast system of tunnels that sit below NKU, which is North Kentucky University, were shut down to the public out of security concerns. The backstory. There are so many legends about the NKU tunnels that we don't know where to start. Among them, the tunnels used to house a nuclear reactor that powered the university. The tunnels were purposely built to withstand a nuclear attack. A staff secretary has been wandering the tunnels lost for years. There is a tunnel system below campus and you could theoretically get around campus through them, but they don't exactly hit every building and they aren't all that easy to navigate. Now, remember, Indians didn't make their tunnels and paths and trails easy to navigate based on defensive purposes, but there is tunnels under the Northern Kentucky University. About 50 miles away from Frankfort is Louisville, Kentucky. It says at the site of the former Belknap building, legend has it that you can enter into Louisville's system of forgotten underground tunnels originally built to aid local slaughterhouses and butchers in transporting meat to market the tunnels have gone mainly unused and kept secret from the remainder of louisville at large it also said you can also apparently enter the tunnel at selbeck hotel now online it's not easy to find tunnels under frankfurt kentucky However, the university, Kentucky State University that's in Frankfurt, has a crime bulletin online. So it says, Kentucky State University Police Crime and Fire Log. It says, the Gene Clergy Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Statistics Act of 1990 is a federal mandate that the Kentucky State University Police and Public Safety Department shares information about our campus crime policies and crime statistics that may happen on or around campus. Okay, so this is talking about crime on or around campus. Now, right here in December of 2019, it says a phone was taken from the halls. Then right here, it says also December of 2019, it says a student was robbed in the underground tunnel. So all of these colleges, which we talked about in the previous video, how the colonizers would put one of their institutions on the land that they didn't want people exploring or digging up, they would put one of their institutions on it to keep that from happening. And that's the same thing they do everywhere they go and colonize. So right here, you got all of these universities on these tunnels. So we're going to move back from 1871 to 1866. 
right here at the Great Portland Maine Fire of 1866. You can see it's in red right here, very near the water's edge. So down here it says, the fire began on the afternoon of July 4th, 1866, as Portland is celebrated Independence Day. Accidentally ignited, the fire was likely started by a firecracker or a cigar. It began on Commercial Street near the present-day location of Hobson's Landing until it closed in 2016 and spread to John Bundy Brown's Sugar House on Maple Street. The intense heat of the fire melted the building's steel shutters and galvanized iron roof, sending out a thick black smoke over the city. Powered by strong winds, the fire swept diagonally across the city through the Old Port and the India Street neighborhood to Monjoy Hill, where, aided by the tireless efforts of the city's firefighters, it burned itself out early on July 5th. Now, so it burned through the India Street neighborhood. Now, what is the India Street neighborhood? I went to portlandmaine.gov website to look at the history of it. And first, we must know that the general description of the India Street Historic District, the India Street neighborhood as we know it today, encompasses a 19-block area extending west to east from Franklin Arterial to Washington Avenue, Mountford Street, and north to south from Congress Street to Commercial Street. So Congress Street, I got to point out, was part of the India Street Historic District. Now, down in the history... It says, the history of the India Street neighborhood is as old as the history of Portland itself, as it was the site of the first European settlement on the Portland Peninsula. Nothing, however, exists from this first settlement or from other early attempts at settlement. The first settlement was destroyed during conflicts with Native Americans in the 17th century, rebuilt and then destroyed again in the late 18th century. Now it goes on to say, life in the India Street neighborhood during the early 19th century revolved largely around waterfront activity. A significant number of the laborers and mariners were free black men who prospered in Portland's maritime economy, settled in the India Street neighborhood and built their own homes. In 1828, the community built their own church, the Abyssinian Meeting House on Newberry Street. Now understand, the Indian Street neighborhood is historically an aboriginal place before they burnt it in 1866. Now, did it have tunnels underneath it? Basically, right here it says that the most commonly known and least interesting is the tunnel under Congress Street. So there's tunnels under that India Street neighborhood that was burnt down in 1866. Through the history books, which has all been a lie, so therefore, if it's a lie, then what's the truth? If it's a lie, then what's the truth?